What is up you guys? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Daniel Holland and I am back with another true crime video. And today we are going to be speaking about the murder of 24 year old Rebecca Gay on Halloween of 2012 by someone that Rebecca, her family, and the community all believe that they could trust. Now, this case really, really highlights the pitfalls of the justice system and the importance of victims' rights, which is a huge thing, because the man responsible had a documented history of violence against women and one time managed to slip his way through the cracks to freedom. But before we can get into the tragedy of Rebecca's death and how it could have been prevented, we need to speak about her life. Rebecca was born on March 26, 1988 to Thomas and Sally Gay, and she grew up with her three siblings in Midland, Michigan, graduating from Bullet Creek High School in 2007. Now, just a few years after she graduated from high school, she ended up giving birth to a beautiful little boy named Conway. And while Rebecca and Conway's father ended up choosing to not continue their relationship, they both worked very hard to co-parent and ensure the best life for their son. And Rebecca, by all accounts, was an incredible mom her whole world revolved around her little boy. Everything she did was to build an amazing life for her family, so she worked hard. She temporarily pursued a career in cosmetology before making the decision to settle in at a retail store in Mount Pleasant. Now she got along great with her coworkers. She quickly moved up into a management position. This was amazing for Rebecca and all of her goals. She was able to get her and her son a home in Broomfield Valley Trailer Park. It was a place that they could call their own. And along the way, she also ended up meeting a man named Aaron that fell into place in their life like he was always meant to be there. Aaron treated Conway and Rebecca with the most love and respect and had plans of proposing to her in the near future. Rebecca was also very close with her family, her mom Sally being her biggest cheerleader, and her mom was engaged to a man named John Douglas White who played a pretty important part in Rebecca's life. Now, Sally had met John White about six years prior, ironically on Halloween, and he was a pastor at a local church. He was well known in the community. He lived in the same trailer park as Rebecca, so he often helped out as much as he possibly could when it came to Conway. He would babysit Conway. He would help Rebecca with the co-parenting exchanges. It was an ideal situation because Rebecca always had someone that they believed had the best of intentions, was a great person right there willing to help her whenever she needed. So Rebecca really had a great support system and a great future ahead of her. Now, she was also particularly excited about Halloween in 2012. Rebecca typically worked night shifts, but recently she had switched to day shifts and this allowed her to spend a lot more time with Conway, including giving her the ability to go trick-or-treating with him. And Conway was three that year. So it was going to be the first time that he really understood kind of what was going on. Um, he'd be able to experience dressing up and walking around door to door. And as a Halloween lover, Rebecca was thrilled about this. Conway had already picked out his cute little costume and Rebecca had decorated their entire home with a ton of scarecrows that she purchased from the store she worked at. They were really in the Halloween spirit and the night right before Halloween, Rebecca shared her excitement with her mom and her boyfriend Aaron on the phone, totally unaware that this would be the last time that she would ever speak with them. The call detailed Rebecca's plans for the following day. This was just like Rebecca to make sure all of her I's were dotted, all of her T's were crossed, and Halloween fell on a Wednesday. So typically on Wednesdays, Conway would be taken to spend the day with his dad, and this Wednesday would be no different. Conway would be dropped off, Rebecca would work her morning shift, and then afterwards she would go with Aaron to pick Conway up and finally go trick-or-treating. So filled with excitement, Rebecca wished everyone a good night, and she settled in to wake up early the following day. But when Rebecca's shift rolled around that Halloween morning, she was nowhere to be found. This, as I'm sure you can imagine at this point, was not like Rebecca. She did not no call, no show. She didn't get to her management position by just skipping out on work. So right away, management knew mm -mm, there is a problem. And so they reached out to Aaron's sister, who also happened to be one of Rebecca's coworkers. And they're like, look, do you or Aaron have any idea where Rebecca is and why she just wouldn't show up to her shift this morning. There was an immediate gut feeling that something was wrong because Aaron had not been able to reach Rebecca at all that morning. She typically always responded to his good morning texts and so they knew they had to go and check on her. So Aaron's sister begged someone from management to go take a drive by Rebecca's home to make sure she was okay. Now they were only able to find her house because of all of the festive Halloween decorations outside, which is honestly just 
gut-wrenching because it's a reminder that Rebecca would never miss this day willingly. But when they got there, it didn't seem that anyone was home. Her car wasn't parked outside. The door was locked. There were no indications that someone was inside. It didn't look like anyone had broken in. And so no one was quite sure what to make of this information. But when Rebecca's coworker went to leave, they spotted something alarming in the distance. A few hundred yards from Rebecca's home was a bar called the Barn Door, and backed into pine trees that lined the parking lot was Rebecca's car. This was bizarre because there's no reason she would have to park her car in this location. Her driveway was literally right there. The bar, like everything is within eye shot. And so if she needed to park somewhere, she would have gone and parked at her house. And despite the fact that this was a bar, she had her son the night before. So it's not like she would have had the opportunity to go out and drink. And if for some strange reason she did, she likely would have walked. And so they knew something was off and the coworker went right to the barn door to see if they had any helpful information. Now, thankfully, the person that was working that morning was the same exact person that had worked the shift the night before. And they were able to say, you know, yes, her car is here. I don't know if they were able to give a timeline of when they first saw it there, but they knew for a fact Rebecca had never come into the bar the night before. But what they were able to help with was getting the coworker in touch with Rebecca's landlord. So once they reached out to Rebecca's landlord and said, hey, we're really worried about her. You know, everything seems fine at her house, but we don't know where she is. Her car is parked straight. Strangely, Lord offered to unlock Rebecca's door so they could go inside and make sure she was okay. She was 24 years old, she was young, she was healthy, but maybe there was a medical emergency, maybe there was just something they didn't know about and she was inside and needed help. But when they got inside of her home, there was no sign of Rebecca, only her favorite purse sitting inside open on the table. And once Aaron's sister and Rebecca's family heard what was found, that she wasn't there but her purse was, the gut feeling got even stronger. This wasn't just a purse. According to Aaron's sister, this was Rebecca's favorite thing in the world at this point. Aaron had gifted this to Rebecca a few months prior, and ever since he did, this is all Rebecca ever talked about. It's the only purse Rebecca ever used. And so seeing that she's gone and this purse is just like haphazardly laying open on a table in her house, didn't feel right at all. So Rebecca's friends and family with all of this information decided to call police to report her missing. Authorities arrived at Rebecca's home, but given the fact she was an adult, they didn't want to immediately jump to any conclusions. They definitely said that they took into consideration the fact that this behavior seemed off and unlike Rebecca, um, but they wanted to just make sure there wasn't just some sort of misunderstanding going on. So they decided they wanted to wait to do anything until around 4.30 that afternoon when Rebecca was supposed to pick up Conway. It was one thing to miss her job. It was one thing to not reach out to family or her boyfriend, but if she didn't come to pick up her son, something was wrong. And so everyone had no choice but to just sit and wait. And I cannot imagine what that must've felt like for her family. And when 4.30 came and went and there was no sign of Rebecca, all you heard were radios going off left and right with authorities jumping into action. It seems that they too had just been waiting for the go ahead, waiting for the moment to do something. And they had everything lined up because right away they were able to execute a search warrant for both Rebecca's car and her home, hoping to figure out what was going on. And right away they were able to determine this was an emergency situation. Around her home, there were also signs that there had been a struggle, but the most alarming thing that they found was a spot on the carpet. Authorities noticed that there was a spot that didn't look as matted down as the rest of the carpet. It was fluffier, and usually that means that it has recently been cleaned, and it was just this one spot. Underneath that fluffy carpet, they saw a dark stain peeking through. Authorities continued to search throughout Rebecca's home to find evidence, information that might give them answers, and they also went to go and check out her car in the barn door parking lot. And immediately, they noticed something was off, and it didn't seem that Rebecca had been the one to drive her car last. Rebecca was a very petite person. She was small framed. And so usually her car seat was pushed really close up to the steering wheel. When they found it, the driver's seat was positioned very far back. And that paired with the strange way that the car was kind of tucked back into some trees. 
Everything authorities were finding up to this point suggested that something may have happened to Rebecca. Foul play was involved. So right away, everything was deemed a crime scene and authorities started to dig a little bit deeper. No one that knew Rebecca could understand how on earth she may have ended up targeted. She was very kind. She kept to herself. She didn't cause any trouble. She wasn't involved in any sort of high risk activity. She definitely didn't have enemies. So the only thing that made any logical sense was this had to have been a stranger that did something to her because no one that knew Rebecca would ever want to harm her. But obviously authorities have to start off closer to Rebecca. So they spoke to everyone that she knew. They began canvassing the neighborhood for clues. And they had two people in particular that they were very interested in talking to. It is safe to assume that you guys watch a lot of true crime. So you know it is not uncommon to look at those closest to the victim. And so the first two people they wanted to look at were Conway's father and Rebecca's new boyfriend, Aaron. And not even necessarily because there was anything that directly pointed to them, but I mean, you can see the situation. This is a new partner. Um, this is also a man that had a child with her. They're having to co-parent on a regular basis. There are so many different ways that this can go wrong and they brought both men in. Now, Aaron willingly cooperated with authorities and he seemed highly distressed about Rebecca's disappearance. He knew how important this day was to her. He knew how important her job was, her son. Aaron stated that he had last spoken to Rebecca the night before, as I'd already stated, and he had not received any sort of communication from her that Halloween day, which was super off. He even was able to show authority something that had worried him when he first heard she never showed up to work. Now, both Aaron and Rebecca had iPhones. And if you have iPhones, you're familiar with the color of the bubbles when you're texting. When you're texting someone with an iPhone, you've got service, you've got everything. The message is usually blue in color. And all of his text messages to Rebecca from as long as he can remember, including the night before, were all blue. He woke up early Halloween morning and it texted her good morning. And for some reason, that text message to her was green, indicating that Rebecca's phone either didn't have service or had been completely shut off. So this helped authorities narrow down the timeline of when something may have possibly gone wrong. Now, aside from that, he didn't have much to offer. So authorities were able to clear him as a suspect and moved on to Conway's father. But just like Aaron, Conway's father also really didn't have too much to add. He spoke highly of Rebecca and said that despite their circumstances, they were on good terms. They worked their hardest to make sure that they did the best for their son. But he did end up leading authorities to potentially the last person to see Rebecca. And it was someone very close to her in more ways than one. As you know, Conway spent Wednesdays with his father. And because Rebecca worked these early morning shifts, John White, her mom's fiance, and the man that lived right down the road in the tra same trailer park would often help out. John White would come over early, watch Conway while Rebecca got ready, help Conway get dressed, and then he would go to the local Meyer grocery store to do the exchange. This was like clockwork type of thing. And according to Conway's father, it was no different that Halloween morning when John White dropped Conway off at around 8.30 a.m. Not that long before her coworkers came and found the house empty, and he may have some information that would help authorities. So they went straight to John to question him. Now, John was also very cooperative with authorities, outlining the details of the entire day. Now, John told authorities he had woken up that morning early and went over to Rebecca's trailer at around 6.30 a.m. And when he arrived, the front porch light was on and the door was unlocked. So he figured Rebecca was awake and expecting him. So he let himself in. But he said that while he was there, he never actually saw Rebecca. According to John, she was in the bathroom getting ready and was just like yelling at him through the door. He said when he first got there, she said that he should go rest on the couch until Conway woke up. Um, she mentioned something about how he should turn the heat down before he left. And so John heard her and did what she said. He went and laid down on the couch, got under a blanket and he fell asleep. And then Conway woke him up sometime around 8 a.m., so an hour and a half later. And at this point, John claimed that Rebecca was already gone. She had already left to work and there was apparently nothing abnormal about this. And so he got Conway ready, dressed him in his Halloween costume, and at around 8.30 dropped him off with his dad. And then he went on about his own day. And the story seemed legit. There didn't seem to be anything strange about this. It's all very plausible. But authorities did notice something odd that piqued their interest. John had fresh cuts on his nose 
and on his hands. And that is probably one of the largest self-defense flags out there. But when they questioned him about it, you know, why do you have all these fresh wounds on you? He seemed to have a perfectly good explanation. John told authorities that that day he had been working on a few things in his trailer and a shelf had fallen on him and that hurt his nose and hurt his hands. And he even was like, hey, I'll take you into my home and I'll show you the exact shelf that fell on me. And he did. And so authorities were like, all right, whatever. Maybe we're looking too deep into this. Been cooperative at this point. He seemed to be open with authority. So they took his word and they continued on their investigation. But you guys, the investigation continued to lead them back to John. As I had stated, this entire time, authorities had been speaking to neighbors, family, friends, anyone that had a relationship with Rebecca to see if they had any thoughts about anyone in her life, if she had maybe mentioned something strange, someone that may have wanted to hurt her. And they had asked a few people what Rebecca's relationship with John was like. And it started to paint a very different picture than a nice man helping out his fiance's daughter. Some of Rebecca's coworkers said that Rebecca had stated numerous times that John made her wildly uncomfortable. I don't know if Rebecca ever stated anything in specific that he did. What I do know is that her coworker said it got to the point that she was considering moving. And you guys, that's a massive deal. She worked so hard to get to where she was, to get a home for her in Conway. And it was going to be very difficult and uproot her whole life to find a new place with a three-year-old son in tow. And so they knew that it had to be pretty serious if she was saying she was willing to completely move because of it. And they weren't the only ones to notice something strange about the way John treated or acted around Rebecca. Aaron also thought that something strange was going on. Aaron told authorities that he got a really bad vibe from John and even described John as obsessed and said that at one point, Rebecca got a perm and it seemed to like, ugh, weirdly like take John over the top. He became that much more obsessive with her and like started to come over every single day and would compliment her. He would show up at her home, show up at her work unannounced. It was just really strange behavior and they like couldn't quite put their finger on what was going on. While a few people noticed these red flags, others that knew John only had great things to say about him, including those at his church, some members of Rebecca's family. So it was a little bit of conflicting information. And so for authority, to make sure they did their job, they did their due diligence, they went to John and asked him to take a polygraph. Again, nothing abnormal. They wanted to be able to start more thoroughly ruling people out. And because they kept getting caught up on John, this is the fastest way for them to do it. It's a typical part of the process. And I just wanna preface this by saying that polygraphs, in my opinion, are a load of crap. Um, I don't think there's any good that really comes from it. I think it's kind of like a luck thing more than anything. There's no protection for innocent people involved. It only usually ever benefits the police department and no attorney, no good attorney at least will recommend that you take one. So with that out of the way, he was hesitant and it actually took a lot of convincing from Rebecca's mom to get him to agree. She's like, look, if you're innocent, just take this. It'll say that you're not involved. You're being honest and they can move forward. He did finally agree. And at this point, authorities are like, mm, we've got our speculations that John may know more and could potentially be involved in whatever happened to Rebecca based off the strange information we're getting from everyone and the strange vibe we're getting from him. So John went with Detective David Patterson to the polygraph exam and Patterson took it upon himself to try and get John relaxed, uh, to trust him, hoping, you know, maybe he will divulge some information. So they're talking, you know, he has him sit in the front seat of the police car and it worked like a charm. Before they even made it to the test, John felt comfortable enough to explain to Detective Patterson why he had been so hesitant to take the polygraph. John confessed that he had a criminal history that nobody fully knew about, including his own fiance and the church. And he told the detective that it wasn't just any criminal history either, but he was a part of an attempted murder case, 
But John brushed it off and was like, you know, no, 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 it's not that big of a deal. It sounds scarier than it is. The case was actually thrown out. Um, I was released. It made it seem like he was like wrongfully convicted or, you know, what have you. But he's like, you know, understandably though, it still makes me worried. So I had my hesitations. And he went on to explain to the detective that after his release, he had turned his life around. And when the church was there to give him a second chance, he took it and he was a great guy. He wouldn't hurt anybody, yada, yada, yada. But hearing this, Detective Patterson was like, he just admitted that he had a criminal history. So while John was taking his polygraph, authorities decided to dig into his background. And what they found, what they found was terrifying. John didn't just have a small criminal history that was seemingly a misunderstanding. No, no, no. He had a violent history that went all the way back to 1980 when he was 22 years old. John had been in the Navy. I think he was out of it at this point and he was living in Battle Creek, Michigan. He was newly married and he decided to befriend his 17 year old neighbor, Teresa Etherton. And one day he decided to invite Teresa over to his basement of his home saying, Hey, I've got an awesome some stock car racetrack that I built. Like, I just really want to show it to you. It's really awesome. And Teresa trusted him. She had no reason not to. So she's like, sure, I'll come and check this out with you and followed him to the basement of his home. But when her back was turned, all of a sudden, John stabs her under her right shoulder blade. So Teresa's obviously shocked and turns to him to figure out what in the hell is going on. And all she sees is John standing there with a sick smile plastered across his face. And within seconds, the brutal attack continues. John ends up stabbing Teresa 15 times and attempts to strangle her. And by some absolute miracle. Teresa survives this attack and ends up escaping. And after receiving much needed medical attention, she named her attacker to authorities. John White had attacked her and she told him the horrific things that he had said and did, including the fact that he had stated that this wasn't his first time. Teresa said, quote, he wiped my mouth off and he kissed me and he held my hand and he said, you're going to go now. I'm really sorry you had to go like this, but you're just a woman. Every time I say that out loud, when I tell you it makes my stomach physically hurt, he clearly had some serious, serious issues and a lot of hatred against women, or he at least did not see that women were of any value at all. Now, John was immediately picked up and charged and convicted of attempted murder. He tried to portray that he was this remorseful, young, idiot kid made just a big mistake and would never do it again. Telling the judge, quote, I wouldn't listen to people that tried to tell me that I did have a problem. And I realize that now. And that just brings up so many questions. He's 22 years old. How many people have told him that he has a problem? What has he done that have made people believe he has a problem? And if he told Teresa, this was not the first time he had done something like this. I'm trying to figure out how many more victims he possibly has. But from what I've seen, he was never linked to anyone else before this. Now, John ended up being sentenced to five to 10 years in prison for this awful attack, which again, I don't think is anywhere near enough, but welcome to the backwards justice system. And he was also required to undergo mental health counseling. But two years later, just two. In 1983, John decided to appeal his conviction, stating that his attorney did not act in his best interest. Allegedly, attorney James Tompert had been paid to defend John by John's father. And John claimed that when the idea was brought up to try to get a third party psych evaluation to use the insanity defense, his dad said, heck no, $1,000. I'm not paying for that. Just find some other way to defend my son. The judge agreed that he was not properly taken care of by his attorney. And so at this point, they were faced with a decision. They could either retry John and start this all over again, or the judge could decide to just resentence him. And ultimately, that's what the judge decided on. John ended up receiving a ridiculous deal that got him out of prison immediately, immediately after two years. And instead, he would just spend the next two years on probation and he was required to undergo mental health treatment. That's it. He had stabbed a woman 15 times and tried to strangle her, and she managed to get herself away. Honestly, he was trying to kill her, attempted murder, and he spent all of two years in prison for it. 
And one of the worst parts is that Teresa had never been notified that he was released. There was nothing in place at the time to really protect victims after the fact. And so one day, Teresa is standing in line at the Secretary of State office when she hears a familiar voice and turns around and she is face to face with John smiling at her exactly like he had done when he stabbed her repeatedly. I cannot even imagine the level of trauma. That is what nightmares are made of. Could you freaking imagine that? Could you imagine having to experience that? So while John had made it seem that this was just a false attempted murder charge, no big deal, he had only managed to get out thanks to an error made by his attorney, which honestly pisses me off because had they worked towards the insanity plea, this man may have been put in a mental health facility forever. Um, but regardless, because of that and the judge making a horrible decision, in my opinion, to release him, he was out and about. And so John didn't stop. And this led authorities to the next charge that John had, something that he had completely failed to tell them about. And you'll understand why once you hear it. So 10 years later, John was still in the area, still married. This time he had two kids and a baby on the way when his urges to harm women crept back up. July of 1994, a 26-year-old young woman named Vicki Sue Wall suspiciously went missing in Comstock, Michigan. And as authorities are working the case, they're scouring over surveillance footage, they're tracking her last moments, trying to figure out where she went, they managed to find what they believed to be the last sighting of Vicki. It was around 3 a.m., the early morning hours that she disappeared in a Meyer parking lot. I feel like there's just too many things connecting here. Vicky could be seen on a surveillance approaching a black truck driven by a white male with a beard. And she hops into this truck, the truck drives off, and at that point, Vicky is never seen again. Now, this ended up leading authorities straight to John White. He had apparently just ended his job as a long distance truck driver and began working at a local textile company and made and who else worked at this company? Vicki Wall. And according to some, the two were very close, if you're picking up what I'm throwing down. And John drove a black truck. He matched the description of the man in the car with Vicki. So they're like, this guy has to possibly be involved. So they brought John in for questioning. And initially, John's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know Vicki. I don't know what happened to her. A, a black truck, a man with a beard, like not me. But when authorities confronted him with the video of her getting into his car, they're like, dude, look at this. Like, this is literally your car. It's literally you in the driver's seat. He finally starts to open up. John ends up confessing to authorities that he and Vicky had actually been having an affair. And that was why he was hesitant to say that he knew her. He didn't want to hurt his wife and, you know, all of this absolute crap. And so he said that that night they did in fact meet up for a good time. But he claimed that he dropped her off shortly after they were seen on surveillance. And when he dropped her off, she was alive and well. Whatever had happened to Vicky happened after they were together. But he did also say quite a few things in this interview that kept him on authority's radar. During his questioning, John also admitted that while he hadn't done anything wrong, by the way, he had been experiencing blackout spells. And when directly asked if it was possible he did something to Vicky during one of these blackout spells, he claimed that he didn't remember doing anything to her, but it was possible. And to support this, authorities had also been trying to figure out, you know, people in John's life, what was he doing that night? Has he expressed anything about his relationship with Vicky? Apparently John's wife had been telling their friends that he suffered from quote, multiple personalities. And it told her that when he would do things, it was as if he was watching himself do it from afar. And then days after John was questioned, he attempted to end his own life. And so authorities strongly felt at this point, there was something that he was trying to hide. So authorities ended up picking John's truck up for forensic testing, and they didn't have a lot at this point in time. DNA testing was around, but it was not it was very, very new, so it wasn't as advanced. And so they were really relying on a lot of what we would now consider like old school techniques to look for evidence, which included spraying luminol. And the truck ended up lighting up in multiple places. But this was the only evidence authorities had. And unfortunately, they were not able to get good enough samples to do DNA testing. They would need to get a large sample, very clean, very fresh. And it appeared as if someone had attempted 
to halfway clean things up after the fact. And so they knew they would have to keep on working if they were going to be able to press any charges on John. And they were hoping they could ultimately get some sort of confession. And then six weeks later, they had a body. A young man had been walking just two miles away from the Meyer store that Vicky was last seen at with John. And he noticed there were two drag marks in the dirt. And he followed these two drag marks in the dirt and it eventually led him to a white tennis shoe. So he's like, that's weird. So he followed it further and it led to an area where very tall grass was kind of matted down and there's a pair of women's underwear. And so he's like, okay, something's not right here. And just a little bit further, when he looks down, there is a horribly decomposed body. So right away, he calls authorities and they show up and they know this is Vicky. Now, unfortunately, she was in fact so very badly decomposed that they were not able to get a lot of information from her remains. The only thing they were able to see for a fact was that she was partially naked. I believe she had a shirt on. I don't know if it was even on all the way and a bra had been around her neck, which I'm not sure based on the way it's described if they are trying to stay, say she was possibly strangled. But regardless, because of the circumstances the scene, the way in which they found her, they were able to say that this was a homicide. They just weren't able to necessarily say how exactly she had been killed. Now, at this point, authorities are like, that's it. We've got a body. This is all we need. And so they decided to pick up John for the murder of Vicky. After all, he had been the last one with her and they ended up finding him in a psychiatric hospital in Kalamazoo. And now I want to take a minute to just kind of look at this. Now, I am not going to deny at all that I believe he had some sort of mental health issues going on, um, that he needed mental health assistance immediately, that he needed to be in the psychiatric hospital because I, I absolutely believe in all of that. But part of me can't help but think back to his first trial and what he was trying to go for, which was the insanity plea. And so I'm starting to wonder if he saw all of his downfalls from his first victim and tried to make sure he was able to work things the way he wanted the second time. I think he knew that they were closing in on him for the murder of Vicky. And if he put himself in a psychiatric hospital, because he did self-admit, by the way, he would more than likely be able to do the insanity defense and get exactly what he wanted. I legitimately think that he took notes. And so anyways, they yank him out of there and they're like, we need a polygraph. We need you to talk to us. And he refuses all of it. And so authorities at this point are like, there's no way we're going to be able to pen first degree murder on him or any murder charges because we only have circumstantial evidence. And so they ended up working out something with John and he agreed to plead guilty to involuntary manslaughter. And this is what is so frustrating about the justice system. Authorities speculated at this point that Vicky had likely been and pressuring John into leaving his wife maybe, and that he had enough, so he strangled her and dumped her body. And despite everyone knowing damn well this was not involuntary manslaughter, this was not any sort of accident or reckless behavior that led to this, John took full advantage of it and told her family at his sentencing that this was a tragic accident. Now, also at his sentencing, the judge pointed out his previous violent history against women and said that he seemed to lack any self-control whatsoever. And so the judge decided to hand him the longest sentence they could under the court of law, which was still only eight to 15 years in prison. And this is where it gets even more infuriating. After John was put into prison on this involuntary manslaughter charge, he was required to see a psychologist. This had been something that had been required of him for like over a decade at this point. And the things that this man admitted to along with his history should have kept him locked up indefinitely. And while I fully recognize that you can't just put any sort of term of sentencing on someone that you want to or that you feel you should, and we can't put this man away for life over involuntary manslaughter, like there are certain regulations to this. I understand that. He at least should have been thrown into a mental facility indefinitely. And I feel like there's some way that they could have done that. And the fact that they didn't ended up being a huge failure to society, posed a risk to everyone and ultimately, in my opinion, is what led to the death of Rebecca Gay. John told his psychologist that he wanted to kill the prosecutor that had worked his case on the Vicki Wall trial. Um, he wanted to kill her. And not just that, he also said he wanted to kill his defense attorney. And not just that, he also said that he then had necrophilia fantasies about them. And I can only say so much about that um, before YouTube totally takes my video down. So if you don't know what it is and you wanna know what it is, Google's your friend, um, but it is barbaric 
insanity. And he just straight up said this. He just like nothing. And he explained this in such detail and with such like matter of factness that they had to go and warn these women, which I'm happy they did, but also puts this like pit in my stomach because they didn't do the same for Teresa. They didn't say, hey, Teresa, this man that tried to kill you is now out. And so again, just all these pitfalls and the way things are being done and the way things are being handled. And also to me, this shows that they knew, they knew the harm that this man could do and they believed that he would do it. They fully believed he would get out and kill these two women. But when the time came and the time had been served, he was simply released. In 2007, after 12 years, he was released back into society without anyone keeping tabs on him, without him going on any sort of registry. He was able to just go out there despite his history, despite the things that he had threatened, despite the fact that they knew he was a bad person and would act these things out, he was just gone. His own son was even worried about his release saying, quote, he knew that he was mentally sick, but he refused to engage it and tell people about it, accept help for it. Those that knew John and the justice system knew he had a big, big problem. And after he was released, he relocated. He knew that he had nothing left for him in this area. He had already burned so many bridges. He had already involved himself in so much awful activity. And so he went north and using his new pastor credentials that he got in prison, he became a pastor at Christ Community Fellowship in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. He began his new life away from his past so it couldn't come back to haunt him, but his fantasies never went away because John had a serious problem. And eventually he went on to meet Sally and he became a part of the family. And so authorities are now wondering if maybe he had acted out those fantasies on Rebecca. Authorities were dumbfounded that they had no idea his history went this deep, that he had managed to go all this time and no one seemed to even know what he was capable of. And when they started to look into it further, they really realized no one did. He wasn't joking when he said that no one knew the extent of his criminal history. John had been somewhat honest with the people in his life that he had a criminal past, but he told everyone very different and much lighter stories about what had happened. He had told Rebecca's mom, for instance, Sally, that he had just been in trouble once and it wasn't his fault. He gave her this story about how a girl he was with overdosed and that was it. And it honestly makes me wonder, he's the kind of person, as you will come to see, is a very there are truths within a lie kind of guy. And so now I'm like, was there some girl that he was with that overdosed that he did something to? Like, I've got all of these questions. And when it came to the church, they also were aware he had a criminal history, but they didn't know the extent of it. And because they saw him as a changed man of God, they focused on his future and not so much his past. He was able to settle right into this community, hiding the things that he had done. And as they are finding out his history, trying to soak it all in, John's polygraph test results come back that he was deceitful. And not only that, not only are they realizing what this man has done in the past and that he's now lying on a polygraph exam, but authorities also found something in his truck while canvassing the neighborhood. All things were pointing to his involvement. When authorities were searching the neighborhood for clues, an officer obviously was like, I'm looking into the back of this man's truck. Like, I'm going to see what's in the bed of his truck to see if there's anything. I don't need a warrant to do that. And he saw what appeared to be large spots of blood and a broken necklace that looked like it had been like ripped off of somebody. And so they're like, look, he's got some questionable things here we need to confront him. And so he was confronted with this information. They're like, you failed the polygraph. We know what you've done. You got blood in your truck. And he acted like he had absolutely no idea what they were talking about. They showed him these pictures of the truck and he's like, oh, that's weird. That looks like blood. And just like went on, like as if that was completely normal to be in the back of his car. And he even put a call into his church to start a prayer chain for Rebecca, claiming that authorities were giving him a hard time and he just wanted to find her. Authorities are like, heck no, man, we're getting a warrant to search your home, to search your truck, because we feel like there is evidence to be found to link you to this disappearance. And sure enough, they very, very quickly found it. Inside of his truck was not just this blood and the necklace, but there was also a bag. And inside of this bag, there were zip ties, there were large construction trash bags, and there was women's underwear. So authorities confront John again about his possible involvement, about what they found now, and he still continues to maintain his innocence. And he even starts telling authorities that he believes Rebecca was just abducted, and he has no idea what could have happened to her aside from that. But his own personal opinion is that someone took 
struck her and left her car in this parking lot. And so after hours on end of John standing his ground, saying he didn't know what was happening, in the early morning hours of November 1st, he finally cracked. Authorities felt that they could potentially get to him using emotions. He very obviously loved Sally. Um, he didn't want to hurt Sally. And so they're like, maybe if we start like hitting these emotional aspects, he'll start talking. And so they started to explain to John what would happen to Rebecca's body in these elements, like how decomposition would happen, like all these graphic things, and told him that Sally, someone he claimed to love, did not deserve what was happening. She was desperately looking for her daughter. Rebecca had a son, a three-year-old little boy that needed his mom. And they said, if you know anything, you need to tell us immediately. Now, there was still a little bit of back and forth. He asked for an attorney, but after sitting with his thoughts for a little bit, they left him alone to just sit there and simmer on everything that they had said. He finally agreed to talk but first said that he wanted to make a phone call. Now, at this point, authorities didn't know what John was about to tell them, but they could kind of figure it out from what he told Sally. John called Sally and told her that she was the love of his life, but she wouldn't ever want to speak to him again. He didn't explain anything. He just kept repeatedly apologizing to her, saying that what was done could not be undone, and then he abruptly hung up the phone. He then told authorities that he wanted a deal that gave him a life sentence and segregation in prison. And then John White confessed to the murder of Rebecca Gay. And the story that he proceeded to tell authorities is so devastating. And all I can think of is his history and all the things that could have been done, should have been done. And I know hindsight is 2020, but when it comes to a violent offender, and their chance to do it again, it needs to be taken seriously. John explained to authorities that he had been having fantasies about Rebecca for weeks. My personal opinion is that it was going on much, much longer than that, based on the complaints that she's telling her coworkers, what Aaron was saying. But he said on this particular night, the night before Halloween, he was on an adult website involving necrophilia and it quote intrigued him and so after drinking about four or five tall boy beers he decided to head to Rebecca's house he arrived to her home at around 2 a.m early morning hours of Halloween and found that her door was unlocked just like he had originally said in his statement and so he let himself inside Rebecca apparently heard the door shut and so obviously she like crept out of her bedroom and was peeking around to make sure no one just got into her home. And as she did this, John began to repeatedly hit her on the head with a rubber mallet until she fell unconscious. But before she fell unconscious, Rebecca looked back at him and said, I know you. That's devastating. Last thing this woman saw was someone that she trusted repeatedly beating her. When John realized that she was still alive and breathing after she fell unconscious, he then decided to wrap a zip tie around her neck and tighten it as tight as he possibly could. And then he sat, this man sat and watched and waited until she died. John then told authorities that he dragged her body into the kitchen and he stripped her down. But despite claiming that he had these necrophilia fantasies, he stated that he couldn't remember if he sexually assaulted her or not. I find it interesting that he wants to admit to all these things, but there's like one thing that he just won't admit to. Um, and at this point, he then went back to his home to gather more supplies before putting her body, Rebecca's body, the bloody towels that he used to clean up and the weapons and zip ties all into a bag and then that bag into the back of of his truck. So that is where the blood came from, the necklace. And he claimed that he had ripped a hole in the bag when he put it in the truck. So that's probably why those items had fallen into the bed, leading authorities straight to him. John then stated that he went to the dumpster of the trailer park and threw out evidence. He threw her phone in there. He threw her keys in there. He threw one of her purses in there. So that's why no one could get in contact with her and why those text messages were green. It's because he had destroyed her phone and tossed it in a dumpster. And then he went down Coldwater Road, the same road that the trailer park was on, and threw Rebecca's body down a ravine. He then went to a nearby intersection and he threw the towels that he used to clean up and the mallet that he used as the murder weapon um, off the side of the road. So he basically tossed evidence everywhere he could within like a mile radius of the house. 
John said that at this point, he knew that he needed to cover up the crime some way to make it look like something it wasn't, lead authorities astray. And the first thing that he thought of was, I'll make it look like an abduction. We drove Rebecca's car to the bar nearby and parked it tucked into the trees, thinking that this was going to throw authorities off and lead them away from what he had really done, which in reality, it just made authorities say, this is some idiot covering something up that they did that makes absolutely no sense and led them straight to John. And then this man, went back to Rebecca's house and slept on her couch for the rest of the night. He then woke up the next morning, got Conway dressed in his Halloween costume and dropped him off with his father as if nothing had happened. I feel like what these criminals do after the crime says so much about them and their possibility of reoffending and where their mindset is during all of this and the level in which this man gave no shits is disgusting. He then went about his day and he even said that he put in a false report to police at some point to try and support his own alibi if it came to it. Like he literally called in pretending to be somebody else saying, oh yeah, I saw John White near Rebecca's house at around 6.50, which was like around the time that he originally told authorities he first went over there. Because John had confessed authorities were able to go to the ravine off of Coldwater Road. And sure enough, like John said, there was 24 year old Rebecca's body. She was only a mile away from her home and her injuries supported the confession that John had given. She had ligature marks around her neck. Rebecca was taken in for an autopsy. Her family was notified and John White was arrested and charged with one count of open murder, which from my understanding basically means that the jury gets to decide if it's going to be first or second degree murder. If you know more than me, please feel free to leave that information down below. I'm working with Google um, and also one count of first degree premeditated murder. Everyone that knew John and the community and Rebecca and anyone involved was shocked. John had managed to trick so many people and people were infuriated to hear about his past. That this man was just out and about despite his violent history Rebecca deserved to live a long and full life. She was always there for everyone. She always gave everyone the benefit of the doubt. And she trusted this man. She trusted him with her son. And he ripped her life from her, from Conway, from her family, from her fiance. So people were screaming that there needed to be changed, that this could have been prevented. John was way too easily able to hide from his past. And, you know, had people known, had there been some registry, some way that the government kept tabs on violent offenders, and not just that, but violent reoffenders, people that may reoffend yet again, maybe Rebecca wouldn't have lost her life. Maybe this man wouldn't have felt that he could so brazenly do whatever he wanted and take life at a whim because no one was watching him to make sure that he did. Survivor Teresa came forward and said, quote, I really hurt for that little boy. I really hurt for her family. They trusted him. So I know exactly what they're going through because Teresa had also trusted him and it almost got her killed. And then she had to go through life knowing that he was let out and no one cared enough to protect her. No one even cared enough to tell her that he had been released. And Vicky's family also came forward with something to say, quote, it tore my heart out because I knew that girl wouldn't have had to die if they would have just kept him in prison. There's something wrong with the courts. There really is. If you look at the timeline of what we know, it seems that pretty much every 10 years or so he would attack. It was 1983. It was 1994. He was in prison for 12 years and then attacked Rebecca in 2012. It was like these 10 year periods and he would just snap. And if you look at his first attack, the attempted murder, he was sentenced, what was that, five to 10 years in prison. If he had been in prison for 10 years, the chance chances that he would have had the opportunity to attack Vicky are non-existent. He wouldn't have. He likely wouldn't have had that job. He wouldn't have known her and he wouldn't have changed her life and the life of everyone else that knew her. But he was released after two years. While he did sit through his entire sentencing in regards to Vicky's murder, had they taken it seriously, his threats and the things that he was saying to a psychologist, he may have again been put away in some sort of psychiatric facility afterwards, be proven a threat to society, you know, high on the reoffender list. He may not have had the opportunity to kill Rebecca either. It's just so frustrating and sick. And despite his denial, the autopsy did show that Rebecca had in fact been sexually assaulted. Quote, 
while she was still alive or shortly after death. This man is an absolute monster. Now, John did end up pleading guilty. It was what was expected of him. It was the deal that they made. And this happened in March of 2013. But even through all of this, it seemed that he had absolutely no remorse. At least he definitely didn't show it. When he was being questioned after he had confessed to the murder of Rebecca Gay, he seemed more concerned about himself saying, oh, I'm such a bad man, I'm a bad guy. What about my church? He was worried about his churchgoers, like forget Rebecca, forget her son, forget her family. He was more worried about himself and how the church would view him than anything else. And at his sentencing, he still showed no remorse. The prosecution made sure to push for the longest sentence possible, saying this man is dangerous. He's proven that not once, not twice, but three times now. And there was no doubt in anyone's mind that if given the opportunity John would absolutely do this again. And he was only 55 years old at the time. So he had a lot of life ahead of him to continue down this road. But the defense attempted to say that his confession and his willingness to avoid the trial to quote, prevent unnecessary harm to Rebecca's family should be taken into consideration when it comes to sentencing. And I am aware that the defense is just doing their job. Their job is to defend this man. But I also feel like for the sake of literally everyone involved and protection of the victim, protection of the victim's families, words should be chosen wisely. And looking at Rebecca's family and this judge and saying that John was trying to prevent unnecessary harm to their family, <laughs> in what and what messed up world, please, and what world did he have any interest in preventing harm? If he had, they wouldn't be there. Rebecca's mom at the sentencing said, quote, John White is receiving more rights than our daughter, who was a law-abiding citizen. When he was previously released from prison, he was the equivalent of a starving lion. Despite the pleas by his defense, no one wanted to see him out of prison. And so in April of 2013, John was sentenced to a minimum of 56 years in prison and a maximum of 85 years. So he would be in prison for the rest of his life. And thankfully, and thankfully at this point, there were actually laws to help protect victims and keep these violent offenders like John locked up. In 1998, which unfortunately again, would not have helped in any of the other cases, Michigan ended up passing a truth in sentencing law. And essentially this law would require these prisoners, these violent offenders to fully serve their minimum sentence before parole was even a word that could be uttered. And so this man was not getting out. Judge Paul Chamberlain said, quote, I find that your sentence today is proportional to the seriousness of your crime. Some people have no place in the community and you are such a person. I don't see a reason why you should ever be released. So finally, after this man had the opportunity after his first offense to go on and attack two other people, kill two other people, he was now going to have to sit for the rest of his life in prison. But he was too much of a coward to even sit through that. He only made it four months into his sentence on August 28th, 2013, when John took his own life. I'm sure the reaction was a mixture of shock, um, but those that knew his history at this point and that this was not the first time he had attempted something like that um, after you know being found red-handed literally, I'm sure they weren't too shocked that this is how things ended. Um, but at least at this point, there is absolutely no way that he can reoffend, And it's really sad to think that him ending his own life feels like the only solid way that he somehow won't escape the justice system. And it really makes you take a look at things. And, you know, I've said this time and time again, but I think it is so important that we push for current legislature that helps to protect victims, that helps amend the justice system because it is a broken system and it has been for a very, very long time. I hope that Rebecca's family has some sort of relief. I cannot imagine the different conflicting emotions they experienced after John took Rebecca away from them. I unfortunately feel like this is a situation where a lot of people probably harbor a lot of guilt that they should not be bearing the weight of on their shoulders. And so I hope that over the years, they have been able to understand that none of this is their fault. None of this is anything that they could have prevented. Um, unfortunately, this man was just too good at making himself appear as something that he was not. Churchgoers had even said that the Sunday before Rebecca's murder, John had given a sermon about being careful of the seeds that you sow within yourself. And little did everyone know, he was quite literally talking about what he was thinking about doing. 
I can imagine how also the churchgoers feel at this point, wondering if every single sermon he gave was some weird, dark window into what his thoughts were, the things that he had done or was planning on doing. Now, from my understanding, I think state by state, there are some violent offender registries. I mean, we've had sex offender registries. We've had those for quite some time, but I know I personally want to know if there's a violent offender near me. Is there someone that has murdered someone that I need to be concerned about? Are they a re-offender? And so I don't think there is a database at a national level. Again, I think it goes state by state, but I do know there are a handful of different organizations that are attempting to have this done on, an, on a national level to make sure that everyone is able to be aware who is around him. I know this always ends up sparking a big conversation about ethics and about our rights. Personal opinion is that if you have the audacity to violently harm someone, if you have violently attacked someone, if you have violently murdered someone, if you have committed any sort of act of violence, I feel like I have the right to know. I feel like it's a big step in self-protection and awareness that we could probably use. So again, I'm interested to see what your opinions are about that down below. On that note, you guys, I'm going to go ahead and go. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to listen to Rebecca's story. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit the subscribe button down below to become a part of the Howland fam so that we can hopefully bring them home together or bring them justice together. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.